Welcome to Inside the Psychologist Studio. I'm Andrew Ward, professor of psychology at Swarthmore College. And what an honor it is for me to engage in this conversation with Lee Ross. Professor Ross received his undergraduate degree in psychology from the University of Toronto and his PhD in social psychology from Columbia University, where he worked with both Bib Latine and later Stanley Schachter. From there, he took his one and only academic job at Stanford University. And this year marks Professor Ross's 50th year as a faculty member in the Stanford Psychology Department. There, he holds the inaugural Stanford Federal Credit Union Professorship. And he is co-founder of the Stanford Center on Conflict and Negotiation. Lee Ross is, as well, a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the recipient of major awards from the Society of Experimental Social Psychology and the Association for Psychological Science, and has delivered numerous honorary lectures and holds two honorary degrees. He has also earned many accolades and awards from Stanford for his teaching, including teaching a legendary graduate seminar in social psychology with his longtime colleague, Mark Lepper. In addition to countless journal articles, Professor Ross has edited two volumes and is the author of three books, including Human Inference and The Person in the Situation, both written with his longtime collaborator, Richard Nisbet, and his newest book, co-authored with Tom Gilovich and entitled The Wisest One in the Room. Now, when one considers the totality of Lee's work, one is struck not just by the sheer number of publications, but by the number of classics he has contributed to our field. Consider that Lee and his collaborators have identified and researched the following phenomena. Belief, belief perseverance, bias assimilation, the false consensus effect, the overconfidence effect, the hostile media phenomenon, reactive devaluation, lay dispositionism, the bias blind spot, naive realism, and of course, the fundamental attribution error. That's quite a list. Indeed, the 1977 chapter in which Lee Ross coined the term fundamental attribution error soon became one of the most cited articles in all of social psychology. And after this session, if you go home or if you're at home now and you Google fundamental attribution error, make sure you put it in quotes so you get just that term, you will see that that brings up 362 thousand hits. That, my friends, is influence. In Lee's early work on biases in social perception and shortcomings in human inference, he helped set the agenda for the field for decades, as well as making important contributions to cognitive psychology and to the then burgeoning field of judgment and decision making. These are fields that Lee, of course, continues to contribute to today while playing a vital role in various applied areas of the discipline, most especially directing his wisdom and talents in efforts towards resolving international disputes. On a personal note, I have known Lee since 1990, when he went out of his way to make it possible for Stanford University to exceed its usual quota and admit one additional graduate student that year, i.e. me. <laughs> As Lee put it at the time, some things are easy, some things are impossible. This one was really hard. <laughs> but by golly, working with his colleague and then chair, Mark Lepper, somehow he made it happen, for which I am eternally grateful. Lee, you changed my life. <laughs> and you saved mine. <laughs> Finally, I have to mention that next year, Lee will celebrate his 55th wedding anniversary with his wife, Judy, which he will no doubt celebrate, surrounded by his four kids and seven grandchildren. Please join me in welcoming Lee Ross. Well, now, aside you. from that personal accomplishment I mentioned at the end, which is pretty impressive, what in your career would you say you're most proud of? Well, uh, I came into psychology at a time when there were two great influences. 
One had been Kurt Lewin or Kurt Levine, and uh, he had set the agenda for modern social psychology. The other really uh, dominating influence was Leon Festinger uh, and his famous student, uh, Stanley Schachter. And uh, to some extent, I would say my career has been an attempt to kind of unite Leon and Lewin uh, to work in a way that was faithful to the Lewinian tradition of doing research that had real world significance and, and uh, addressed real world concerns and problems, and at the same time doing research that had a little bit of splash and dash and, and uh, narrative value in the, in the tradition that Leon pioneered so well. Okay, so let's start at the beginning then. Can you talk about where your journey as a psychologist began, and is there something specific in your background that sparked your interest in the field of psychology? Uh, well, uh, I grew up in some ways in a classic marginal situation as a child in a very non-religious Jewish family in a very religious Jewish neighborhood. So I did have the advantage of that classic kind of being in a culture and also looking at it from the outside. But more particularly in terms of specific phenomena, my father was a diehard red, an old <laughs> communist of the Bolshevik variety. <laughs> and uh, the first time I really had an inkling of a psychological phenomenon was seeing him and his comrades deal with the various shocks that were occurring, the various ways in which uh, the Russian Stalin, that regime, was being discredited. And they were kind of absorbing one shock, one disillusionment after another. And yet they retained the faith. And I was puzzled by this, by looking at the capacity to rationalize, we now would say, reduce dissonance. And uh, many years later, when I was studying at Columbia, I was kind of surprised at how much the great dissonance theorists had not bothered to talk about the phenomena of rationalization in the real world, where people were dealing with really difficult dissonance reduction problems, not just uh, uh, reds having to reconcile their positions, but people in the, United, in the southern United States having to reconcile their history, that this, this process of rationalization and dissonance reduction was ubiquitous. And Festinger was doing such a brilliant job studying dissonance theory, but it seemed to me, just recalling my childhood experiences, that he didn't apply it to problems that were anywhere near as interesting as the ones that he might have done for all his talent, and God knows how talented he was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you just mentioned Columbia University. How did you end up at Columbia University, where you worked with Bib Latine and ultimately with Stanley Schachter, and, as I understand, formed a lifelong friendship and collegial partnership with Richard Nisbet? Right. Well, it's an interesting thing. Uh, as you get older, when you're asked to comment on your life arc, increasingly I find that people tend to talk about adventitious events, about contingencies. I just happened to meet this person, and this person just happened to help me along, and, and, or I went on this trip, and, I, and on the trip I saw this, and that led to this other thing. And uh, the kind of construction of, is it due to the person or is it due to the situation, kind of falls by the wayside and you increasingly see your life as having been determined by kind of small coincidences. Uh, so in my case, I could tell the narrative very convincingly. It starts out when my wife and I, I was married as an undergraduate, when we were walking on the uh, green outside the University of Toronto on a Saturday and we bumped into John Arrowwood, who is my undergraduate advisor, and John said, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to go to graduate school? 
and I was very naive, and I didn't even know that graduate school supported people. <laughs> and uh, I said something to the effect of, well, uh, if I win this Woodrow Wilson, I may be able to afford to go to graduate school, and uh, so I'll go to the University of Toronto. And John, without any hesitation, said, you don't have to win the Woodrow Wilson, they support you, you should go to Columbia, and you should work with Stanley Schachter. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what I did. Uh, when I first got there, it was the case that Stanley was doing research on obesity, and the most exciting work that was being done was being done by Bib Latine, who I'm thrilled to see in the audience today. And Bib was doing his classic work with John Darley on bystander intervention. And I got involved in that research uh, for a period of time. And uh, then this guy, Dick Nisbet, came along. And just by coincidence, he was a fourth year student, I was a first year student, and he uh, said, uh, well, it's great, you should work with Stanley Schachter. And I said, well, I'm doing interesting stuff. He said, no, no, you should work with Stanley Schachter. So I said, well, okay. Uh, and I think he also importuned Stanley Schachter and said, you should work with Lee. <laughs> uh, and uh, I formed a lifelong friendship with Dick and a very important colleague and very important uh, mentor. And I kind of got the best of a lot of things. I learned, I was exposed to Bibb's brilliance as an experimenter and his, uh, the grace with which he wrote and uh, Stanley's kind of remarkable infectious enthusiasm where whatever Stanley was working on seemed to him and everyone around him to be the most important thing in the world that any sane person could be working on. And he was very good at inspiring that uh, in his students. Then by pure coincidence in Stanley's, uh, my, uh, third year of graduate school, Stanley went on sabbatical, and this guy named Phil Zimbardo oh, wow. came. Wow. And I worked with Phil Zimbardo uh, for uh, one year. And just by coincidence, he went to Stanford University. And when he went to Stanford University, I think he talked me up a little bit. I ended up at Stanford <laughs> University. So this incredibly lucky, weird thing. Now, <laughs> I have to be a little careful now because this is going to sound boastful, but I don't mean it to, because I think every one of you could tell a similar story about how you got where you were. And uh, many years ago, I was reflecting on that, and I noticed something about the writings of Kurt Levine, of Kurt Lewin. Lewin does an odd thing. He says, behavior is a function of the life space. And then he says, the life space includes the person and the situation. And you might say, well, that's an odd formulation. Why doesn't he just say behavior is a function of the person and the situation? And my understanding of that is that Lewin recognized that you're a part of your life space. And the things that are happening to you are happening to you in part because it's you, because of the effect you have on other people and the effect that the, uh, the way in which you and the environment kind of mutually construct each other. So just to make the obvious point, uh, it isn't the case that John Arrowood, my first dear mentor, said to everybody you happened to meet, you should go to Columbia and work with Stanley Schachter. <laughs> and it's not everybody who, uh, uh, I remember talking to the great biologist Paul Ehrlich, and he told me he showed his butterfly collection to the man who was the most famous uh, lepterologist in the United States he, as a, a teenager. And he invited Paul to come and work with him for the summer. And Paul tells the story of this incredible coincidence. And I remember saying to him, yeah. well, did he offer that to everybody? <laughs> and Paul said no. But I think there was some deep psychology here because we experience ourselves as constant. 
So we are not salient to ourselves as a determinant of behavior. And it can be things that advantage us, it can be things that disadvantage us, it can be things that just distinguish us. But, but to us, they don't seem important. So that leads me to my perfect segue to Stanford. You talked about colleagues at Stanford and how you ended up there. Tell me what it was like when you got there in 1969 and did that particular environment influence your work? I can't imagine it didn't. Well, you know the Stanford environment as well as I do. Uh, by legend, I've been told that the way I got my job at Stanford was that Stanley Schachter phoned up Al Hastorf and said, literally, I have for you a boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think it works that way anymore, by the way. <laughs> no, and I, I never interviewed. Yeah, that definitely doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so I arrived, and I had published a little bit, but not the way it is nowadays. <laughs> and uh, first thing I met was Phil Zimbardo there, who had helped grease the skids, and Phil said to me, this is just like the New York Yankees. Everybody just takes for granted that everybody else is good. It's really scary. And it was really scary. It was an intimidating faculty. It was the only people in personality were Bandura and Michelle. The uh, cognitive group had lesser lights like Roger Shepard, uh, Gordon Bauer, Dick Atkinson. <laughs> uh, developmental was Eleanor Maccabee. So it was, I don't need to go through, it was an right. intimidating group and you really, takes a while to feel like you belong and it's kind of scary and I, I, I'm seeing Jeannie and I'm seeing Barbara and you, you, you all know what I'm talking about, that it's it's a very warm, in some sense, welcoming place, and you're glad that everyone communicates to you that you will certainly do important things, but you're saying to yourself, am I going to be able to do anything important? <laughs> and it's kind of a scary situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, speaking of scary, <laughs> when I look at the number of citations for that 1977 article, that's pretty intimidating. So let's talk about that. In your advances in experimental social psych chapter where you coined the term fundamental attribution error, that paper became an instant classic. Can you talk about the circumstances that led you to write that particular chapter? And maybe also tell us, how did you come to coin that term? Yeah. It certainly caught on. Uh, yeah. Yes, well, uh, it's often referred to as Ross's fundamental attribution error, as if I'm the one who made the error. <laughs> <laughs> but, it was uh, no error. <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, it's part of that story. Uh, when I was coming up for tenure, uh, it didn't turn out to be an easy process. It was somewhat unclear whether I should get tenure or not. And then, those days, it was a pretty informal process. People, a bunch of guys, and it was largely a bunch of guys, would get together and decide whether you were worthy or not. And uh, in my case, they said, well, he's done a few little things, and they're kind of interesting, and some people who know the work well speak well of it, but I don't see how it hangs together. I don't know what it's really all about. Uh, why don't you get him to write something? So we did something in those days that was very rare, they asked me to do, which was to essentially uh, put together a research statement. This is what I do. So I wrote my research statement, and in my research statement I described uh, the various things I had done, and the term fundamental attribution error came up because I was distinguishing it from what I had done. I said, okay, so I've done this work on belief perseverance and I've done this stuff on overconfidence and a, a few little things. Uh, but the fundamental error that people make, or at least the error on the fundamental task, uh, involves uh, 
a failure to acknowledge the importance of the situation in determining behavior. And uh, I went on to very briefly make the point that an awful lot of what was most important in social psychology, uh, the most clever demonstration experiments, had done exactly that. They had shown that to a larger extent than we realize, changes in the, in the situation, small, sometimes not obvious changes in the situation, can produce big changes uh, in behavior. That had been implicit in the work of Lewin when he talked about channel factors. It had been explicit in the group dynamics tradition when they talked about the effect of social influences and social norms. And uh, in the beautiful work that Bib and John were doing, it had the practice where you would say, most people think that whether people will be heroic and help out or be lazy bystanders and do nothing depends on their, on their particular virtues or personality. And what Bib and John were doing was saying, no, it can depend on subtle, small features of the situation. And that study happened to be about one small feature of the situation, which is whether you experience it alone or in the presence of other people. But I was thinking that many of the classic experiments, the Friedman, Fraser, the foot in the door experiments, many of these had that same property, that, that if you actually saw someone behaving the way people behaved in that situation, and you were asked to account for it, you would cite something about the actor. You would say they're extroverted, or they're brave, or cowardly, or honest, or dishonest. And what we, as a discipline, were doing was showing again and again, if you tweak the situation a little bit, you can have a big effect on behavior. And of course, that was anticipating what was going to be one of the most important applied traditions. Because in some ways, that's good news. Lots of important problems, lots of difficult things that we try to accomplish. Sometimes we can make real progress by changing something relatively small. Anyway, so uh, the, the small answer is yeah. that when I came to write about that, it happened to be a chapter. It happened to be a section heading. So I put it in capitals. <laughs> And the rest is history. So, so <laughs> I, had been, I had been talking about, the, about this fundamental error for a long time. I yeah. had talked about it with regard to the work that Nisbet and Jones had been doing. Mm -hmm. I had talked about it with regard to the work that Daryl Bem had been doing when I had said, how come in these interpersonal simulations, the person doing the simulation is getting it wrong? They're inferring that the, someone has a particular ability or a particular uh, preference when, in fact, they don't. They must be getting it wrong. What are they getting wrong? They're not uh, taking into account the situation. So I had written about it many times, but I had used the word. I had just said it was a fundamental error. And this time I called it the so fundamental error. So it changed error. from a, a to the. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Someone making fun one said, that was your most important article. Yeah, it turns out that <laughs> article. The change from A to Z. <laughs> That's pretty good, Lee. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, one of my favorite studies that you've ever done was in many ways exemplifying the fundamental attribution error, your so-called college bowl or quiz bowl study. Can you talk just a moment about where that came from? Right. Well. Uh, when you ask psychologists where studies came from, they almost always have a good story. And sometimes it's true. <laughs> uh, I remember Solomon Ash telling me where, how he first got the inspiration to do the, uh, the, uh, his the conformity, conformity studies. studies. Right. And he talked about it how it arose from an event at a Passover Seder. And he <laughs> right. told me the story in loving detail. And then I yeah. talked to some other folks. And said, oh, yeah, he's been telling that story for many years. <laughs> and it's just a story. <laughs> it may be just a story. It's, it, it ought to have been true. Right. And in this case, the story, however, is true. There you go. And it relates very much to this beginning, the story about first coming to Stanford. So by pure coincidence, uh, I hadn't yet finished my 
oral defense of my dissertation. And so I had arrived at Stanford and felt a little shell-shocked and intimidated. And then I went back and defended my thesis at Columbia. And I, you were on my committee, Bib. I, I, I'm pretty sure when I was there. And uh, there was a it was a bunch of guys having fun at my expense, you know, <laughs> asking esoteric questions. They didn't care what I really said by way of answer, but they were having a good time showing off. And someone who will go nameless, a very famous perception psychologist, his very first question to me was, what is the wavelength of red light in Angstrom's? Because you were showing light on peanuts. Because my yeah. dissertation, yeah. Uh, one of the things we had done was dimly or brightly eliminate cashew nuts. <laughs> cashew nuts. <laughs> anyway, uh, and I was nonplussed. And it kind of went on like that. And people were asking questions. And I, I really felt at a big disadvantage. But then, by coincidence, when I got back to Stanford, I was scheduled to pinch hit on someone else's orals. So in just literally a week later, I was sitting on someone's orals. And I noticed how different the experience was when you were asking questions <laughs> when, than when you were answering them. So we kind of bottled that phenomena, and we produced an interaction whereby students were asked either to become the quiz master or the contestant. And the quiz master had to make up hard but fair general knowledge questions, and the quiz master had to answer them. No, the contestant had the, to answer them. I'm sorry, yeah. the contestant right. had to answer them. And the result was that obviously the quiz master had an enormous advantage since they had to ask questions that they knew the answer to. <laughs> it was built into the thing. And the, you know, so they would say something like, uh, what novel starts out with, it is the best of times, it was the worst of times, and the student would, other student would look, I have no idea, and he'd tell them the right idea, and we'd, it would be that, or it could be about any topic, who has the record for the most RBIs in a single year? For those of you, Hack Wilson, 190. Uh, <laughs> now, you must think I know something about baseball. From that. But anyway, the point is that the study goes very well, and the result at the end of it is the contestant, a Stanford undergraduate, thinks that he knows much less than the other person, and indeed thinks he now knows, has less general knowledge than the average Stanford student. You have to kind of appreciate the species to realize how rare it is for a Stanford student to say, I actually am below average. <laughs> they didn't get there by saying, I'm below average. Yeah. So, but that was a demonstration where the advantage was perfectly clear, and yet people couldn't make allowance for it. And I went on to try and show other situations in which people did not make adequate inferential allowance. And, and I, it was a little bit of a shift. Instead of saying, what caused the behavior. We're just saying, you observe a behavior. What did you learn? And typically, people think they've learned something about the actor, not something about the situation. If I said, here is somebody who was in Latin A's bystander intervention study, and he sat there while the smoke came in the room and did nothing, uh, do you want to hire him? Do you want to hire him in a responsible position? And people will say no. And they won't ask, well, what was the situation? Were there other people in the room? Were they alone? That we typically don't do. We don't look to the situation for explanations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So much more recently, you've written about what you would call the truly fundamental <laughs> attribution <laughs> error. Yeah. What were you referring to, and how does it relate to the previous work that you just alluded you know, well, to? Well, Andrew. <laughs> Um, when I did that uh, advances paper, uh, when I did that paper that became an advances paper, the way it happened was that it was sent out for review 
by various people to review me for tenure. And one of them was Leon Festinger, uh, who said, very, no, yes, he's a bright boy. Uh, one was uh, Ned Jones, who really liked it quite a bit. And his reaction was, hmm, I think I already said this. <laughs> and uh, the other was Len Berkowitz, who said, well, I'm yeah. going to publish it. Uh, so Jones had said at the time, well, uh, he was, had some reservations about the term, the fundamental attribution error. He said it, it wasn't fundamental, meaning it wasn't irreducible. And indeed, you agree is, with that? Yeah. We, we can talk about where it comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, he said it isn't just about attribution, mm -hmm. and it isn't always an error. <laughs> he said those were three things wrong with it, but the worst thing was he hadn't thought of it. Yeah, <laughs> didn't come up with that term. That's what Ned said, and uh, so he started using the term, the, uh, the dispositionist bias. bias. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I don't think the dispositionist bias has caught on or, quite as or well. Or the correspondence <laughs> bias. He, yeah. The correspondence right, bias, right. I'm sorry, has caught on quite as well. And then the attribution error does yeah, roll I off the I think you top. looked it up, didn't you, Andrew? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't quite make it to 362,000 hits. <laughs> but now you really are writing about what you call the truly Right. Fundamental and so, so what's the difference there? OK, so the truly fundamental attribution error is really the illusion of objectivity, that I have a sense that what I perceive is the way it really is. Uh, and that starts just with the fact that as human beings, we perceive a real world that has color and solid substances. And we take it for granted that our perception of things are as they really are. And as long as we're in a community where we're all agreed and we all experience things like oak trees as oak trees and uh, sunsets as sunsets, it causes no problem. But in many, many contexts, different people construe things differently. But in each case, people think that the way they see the world, the way they construe it, uh, not just how they see it, but how they feel about it, what their priorities are, what they think is appropriate to do, they think that that's the natural response, that they're being objective. And therefore, to the extent that other people see it differently, the thing to be explained is, why do those other people see it differently? And sometimes we're sympathetic, we'll help them out and explain how things really are. <laughs> and uh, uh, sometimes we'll see it as evidence of fact that they're bad people. But you see it in completely ordinary things. You see it uh, uh, in uh, elderly couples arguing about how to set the thermostat. One says, the room is too cold. And the other says, no, it's lovely. <laughs> and one of them will agree to accommodate the other and from their viewpoint, sit in a boiling hot room to accommodate their spouse. But they have no doubt that the room is actually boiling hot and there's something wrong with their spouse. <laughs> the great comic George Carlin had a line. He said, did you ever notice that uh, everyone driving, he's talking about on the freeway, uh, is either a maniac or an idiot? <laughs> and there's a way in which a first take is to say, yeah, I kind of have noticed that. Uh, everybody driving faster than me is a maniac, yeah. and everyone driving slower is an idiot. And it's almost true by definition, because if I thought I should drive faster, I would drive faster. If I thought the weather, the conditions were such that one should be driving slower, I'd be driving slower. But that metaphor really applies to everything. If, it, if you're talking about progressives in politics, are we moving fast enough? Or are we moving too fast or too slow in changing things about gender roles? Or are we changing things about the way we're distributing or redistributing income? And everyone has the sense that they've got it about right. They're the sensible moderate. And everybody who is to their political right is a crypto fascist. And everybody who's to their left is an unrealistic dreamer. They, <laughs> that we get it just about right. And so this is a ubiquitous and I, I phenomenon. And I suspect in today's political climate, where you have 
a certain stimulus called the media presenting either one side or the other, you see this phenomenon just all over the place. Well, of course, the, the so-called hostile media phenomena, yeah. which uh, Lepper and Vallone and I looked at, yeah. really preceded. This was the easiest study I ever did <laughs> in terms of working. You make the following derivation. If I, if I see the world as white and you see it as black, right. and someone comes along and says, it's kind of gray, a mixture of black and white, we're both going to be dissatisfied. So we make the startling prediction that both the left and the right are going to think that the media are biased against them. <laughs> and so we essentially just bottled that phenomenon. We did it with regard to a tragic event. There had been a, a, a massacre in the refugee camps on the outskirts of uh, Beirut in the camps at Sabra and Chatella, and uh, it had been carried out by, phalange, by uh, phalangist uh, gunmen who were uh, sort of right-wing Christians. And there was a, a lot of question about whether Israel was involved, what, was Israel responsible, were they acting on their behalf? And so we filmed that event, and we uh, showed the, me the uh, media news coverage of it for a week to a group of students. And uh, some of them were in our study because they had been designated or designated themselves as strongly pro-Israeli. Some had been designated as strongly pro-Palestinian. And some were neutrals who saw themselves as not particularly concerned with the issue, not particularly knowledgeable. And the data were really quite remarkable. There were no overlapping cases. Everybody who thought that, who labeled themselves as pro-Israeli saw that coverage as more anti-Israeli than anyone who saw the coverage and was anti-Israeli. There was no overlap uh, in the data. And it's kind of interesting for me, it was kind of uh, nice because this is an example where it was a natural experiment. We didn't cleverly design the materials to make this happen. The materials were designed by CBS and NBC News, who, if anything, wanted their coverage to be seen as fair and impartial. Uh, and uh, from the viewpoint of individuals, the individuals would like to have seen the media as favoring them. But this phenomenon was strong enough so that they didn't. And everybody not only saw the media as biased against them, they wanted to it censored. They thought it would be harmful to show and would turn people against their just cause. So it was a kind of dramatic demonstration. I have to say, though, what I found most admirable about, about your career isn't, is that you're not just documenting these issues and problems. You're trying to solve them. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I create them. Yeah, <laughs> just the opposite. For three decades, you've been involved in citizen diplomacy and conflict resolution in the Middle East and also in Northern Ireland and other places around the world. How did all that come about? Was it the research sparking your desire to do something about it? What happened there? <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking we've had, I've traveled there a lot, but more we've, we've brought people here. Typically people who are already doing things, uh, citizen groups, so-called public peace processes, where you have groups of people who are already trying to accomplish this. A little bit of it was one and a half track diplomacy, but I'm remembering Judy, my wife, saying when we have guests, she said, uh, you're bringing someone. Is this another person who's done time in jail for bombing? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and the answer is usually yes. Didn't phase you. <laughs> it didn't phase me. But, um, well, actually, there's a kind of interesting history and uh, Strangely enough, it relates to our APS president, uh, Barbara, her husband Amos, and uh, Kenneth Arrow, and Robert Wilson, three very eminent folks, were doing a seminar, kind of running seminar every year with a different topic. And one year, the topic they decided to do was conflict resolution, or I think it was actually just conflict. Mm. Uh, and they had been doing work on judgment and decision making very broadly. And so they invited Robert Manukin and I to join. Uh, and uh, I 
wrote a very short paper on what psychologists had to say about this topic. And it was very short, because I didn't think that very much of what they had to say uh, was useful. Uh, the main thing I brought was a piece of, again, Lewinian wisdom. And I said that uh, Lewin, looking at this kind of problem, would say, well, there, everyone knows there are, what the solution is going to be if there were a solution. Everyone, you know, that the outlines had been apparent forever and people don't get there. And so Lewin said two things. One, you learn about phenomena by trying to change them. Mm. And the second thing he had said is, don't ask what forces you can bring to bear to produce change. Say, what are the resisting forces? Mm. What can you remove? What's getting in the way? And so I wrote a paper on what I thought were, what are some of the barriers to conflict resolution? What are the psychological barriers? What are the negotiation barriers? What are structural barriers? And I wrote this two-page paper, and I presented it to the seminar. And uh, we all agreed it was an important topic at the time. And so we joined, and we, for a year, carried on the seminar on that topic. The Hewlett Foundation came along and said, it's really a, an embarrassment. We have these conflict resolution centers all around the country, and we don't have one at Stanford. Uh, can we back up the truck and you guys take some money and, <laughs> and uh, set up a center? And we all said, no, no, we really just enjoy getting together and talking and, and uh, having dinner you know, yeah. with each other. Who and, wouldn't? <laughs> and uh, the students said, no, no, have a center, have a center. Okay. So Bob, who is a little bit more entrepreneurial than Amos or I certainly, uh, agreed to do it, and so we founded the Stanford Center. And because it existed, then people started to come to us. And in particular, one group that came to us were a group of Palestinians and Israelis who were looking for a way to conduct some negotiation at a time when it was forbidden by Israeli law. So they asked us to provide cover, to be a beard, as it were, for their meeting where they would get together for a, quote, academic conference. Uh, and we agreed to do it, but only if we were involved, if we were actually involved. And so we, we uh, got involved with those people and then also in Ireland. And consistently, though, uh, the theme was what stands in the way of agreement. And that got refined over the years to what stands in the way of a common future. Can you, can you get people to say, if, what would a bearable future, what would a shared future look like? Why can't you get there? So what can you do about that? And, and our ideas changed over the years somewhat. Increasingly, they came to focus on relational issues. And we said that we, we kind of came to have a fairly radical perspective and said, you know, writing the agreements, this is a waste of time, all the effort that's going into thinking how exactly do you write the details of the agreement. Is that sort that, of a peace agreement of some the sort? peace agreement, yeah. that the real thing is, how do you produce people who believe that the other side see a bearable future for both sides? And do they trust them? Do they trust them to get there? Do they trust them to keep the peace if they get there? But that becomes the, the critical issue, not exactly what are you trading for what and who does what and who does where. So we came to have a fairly specific approach, and it very much did involve relationship building rather than uh, craftsmanship and making agreements or big insights about negotiation strategies. But I suspect that those experiences also did inform your own work in the laboratory over the years. Uh, they did, and they mainly, in recent years, have pushed me to become increasingly interested in the phenomenon of rationalization. Again, going back to the dissonance roots, but treating the problem more broadly. How do people manage to continue to feel good about themselves? How do they manage to feel good about their group when there's lots of reason not to? And uh, I was talking to a very eminent biologist uh, again, the same guy, Paul Ehrlich, and he, he pointed me to something and he said, uh, you know, 
uh, all creatures, all, all animals, or at least many animals, all mammals, certainly all simians, tend to favor the in-group over the out-group when it comes to allocation of goods or protection. Mm -hmm. He said, humans are unique in two ways. Uh, one, uh, they extend the in, they think of the in-group not just as kin, uh, but as uh, fictive kin, that people who we treat as if they're kin, they're members of our, of our community, or they're members of our political party, or they share our religion, or they share our, our language, or they share our skin color. They even may share who they root for, what sports teams they root for. Uh, that we tend to treat those people as if they're us, they're in group, as if they're connected to us by blood. And the other thing is only human beings feel the need to rationalize doing so, to explain why we're more entitled, why we're entitled to more than we're getting, why it may seem unfair, but actually it's fair or it's just that human beings are unique. And so the, for moral philosophers, the good news is that we feel a need to justify. Mm. The bad news is we're really good at it. Yeah, right, right. We're really skilled. <laughs> uh, and so that's... Fascinating. I, I um, have to follow up because in a way you've come full circle. You started talking about rationalization and you've come back to rationalization. If you were to give advice to current students in psychology, current graduate students, it sounds like you could draw on any number of experiences and wisdom that you've accumulated over the years. <laughs> What's the most important lesson you'd want to <laughs> convey to them? Well, uh, getting into academia nowadays, they have to start out by rationalizing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> That's no. probably true. No, uh, uh, well, uh, I think How can I say this? The joy of being an academic is, particularly in psychology, is th there's a, a seamlessness, the connections between the things you think of every day as a friend, as a colleague, as a partner, uh, as an observer of the political scene, and uh, the kind of things you do work on. That's an enormous privilege to to have your life be integrated in that way. And so I would, first of all, advise students to not become prematurely professional, mm -hmm. not to say, where can I read about a study that I could do a follow-up on? Instead, to look at the world, to read the newspaper, to say, what's going on in the world? What's going on that doesn't make sense? Why is it going on? And to feel free to have those kind of conversations. Uh, I think the drinking coffee late into the night or beer and just talking. Uh, students today have become much more professional, much more efficient. They don't want to waste time. And they think that talking is wasting time. Uh, Schachter, I don't know if you ever heard him say this, Bill, but he used to say, you know, everyone knows that when you're working and the work's going really well and you're working hard, uh, you're having the most fun. But the reverse is true, too. Sometimes when you're having the most fun, you're doing your most important work. When you're having the most fun, just the joy of, of talking to friends about things worth talking about and thinking about, thinking about books, uh, novels that you've read, um, and thinking about them like a psychologist, saying what, what's going on and why, that uh, you can be doing some really important work uh, at that time. And so just, to, I worry a lot when I see women managing families and careers, and they're very efficient, and they're getting everything done, they've written down what they have to do, and I, I want to say to them, make sure, you know, you just schedule some time that's empty, when you can think a little bit, mm -hmm. when you can talk a little bit, don't you know? You want your if you're going to if you're going to oblige your husband to be a better partner, make sure that some of what you demand is that you have time to think and relax, 
not just time to fit everything in and get your work done. That's terrific. I, I think we've had a lot of fun with this conversation right now. And I want to thank the APS organizers, APS President Barbara Tversky and the other organizers who allowed us to continue this conversation that we've been having for many years and I'm sure it will go on. I want to thank the audience both here and at home and most importantly thank you Lee for sharing these incredible insights. Thank well, you so much. I want to thank all of you for coming. I'm seeing some familiar faces and uh, you started out by asking me what I was most proud of and I think I'm most proud of the collection of of wonderful students I've had over the years who've become friends and the mentors who've meant so much to me. Thank you, Lee. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you, everyone.